This is Off Planet Radio. Welcome back to Off Planet Radio, Off Planet TV. I'm Emily Moyer, and we have a very different kind of show for you tonight. Um, about two months ago, I was on the uh, my first non-alternative media podcast. That was on the show Binger Purge with uh, Demo and Joe, and I was there to review. I was the first guest that they had on their show, and I was there to review the third season of Stranger Things. And you know, I always like to um, sort of. Pay back, help out the people that have me on their show by having them on our show. But with this, I was kind of curious, well, how am I going to do that? Because these aren't usual alternative media kind of guys. But when I was on their show, it was an absolute pleasure. But I was also, it was really cool to see they were pretty open to all the things that I was talking about. Neither of them seemed totally shocked at the idea that the things that were going on on Stranger Things could actually be going on in real life. Um, and so I decided that it would, would be interesting to have them on our show to have a conversation with two guys who are not conspiracy theorists or, you know, deep, deep in the alternative media and, and all of the political or metaphysical or mind control things of the day and just kind of have a conversation with two regular guys. A lot of people have actually in that meantime, after I decided to do that, been asking me you know, to do a show about how you can talk to your friends and family without them losing their minds or whatever about these kinds of topics. And I thought this is going to be a great opportunity to do that. So here for a really cool conversation about conspiracy, chaos, comedy, and control from the Binger Purge podcast, it's Joe Taylor and Paul Dimitropoulos. Welcome to Off Planet Radio. Hey, Emily. Thanks for hey. having us. Thank you. We're psyched. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> so full disclosure, I have known Demo for probably almost 20 years, maybe that's about 15 or 16 15, years. By 15, 16 yeah. years. Yeah, we used to work together at the Cheesecake Factory. Um, and uh, if you went through a few years at the Cheesecake Factory and you don't believe in conspiracy, then I think there's something wrong with you, Dino. <laughs> 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 that entire setup is a conspiracy theory, right? Exactly. <laughs> so um, I've known Demo for a long time. Uh, his girlfriend is one of my best friends, but I didn't see Demo for about 14 or 15 years. So I don't have really much idea about what his thoughts are on the things going on in the world, if he believes in conspiracy theories, if he knows about this stuff. I don't know what his politics are. And I just met Joe two months ago when I did their podcast and I spent about 45 minutes with him. So this is kind of a cool conversation where I don't know everything about you guys and I'm super excited to do it. Um, but before we get into all of that stuff, why don't you tell people a little about your podcast, what Binge or Purge is, uh, how you got into doing it, what, you know, what's going on there with you guys. Yeah, thank you. Um, so we have a podcast called Binge or Purge, and we review exclusively uh, streaming content. So Netflix shows, uh, Netflix original movies, Amazon, uh, same thing, Hulu. We also include premium cable like HBO and that type of stuff. Because there's too much good stuff on HBO to ignore, you know, so. <laughs> or bad stuff. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so we do all of that, and it's, uh, we do it once a week. It's on iTunes. It's on Google Play, uh, Spotify, Listen Note, just about everywhere. We just started our YouTube channel. Yeah. So we have uh, our, our first, our last three episodes up, and we, we're just starting out. We're pretty new. Uh, we just recorded our 25th episode the other night, and we'll have that up shortly. And we also just did our awards, our yeah, annual awards show. Yeah, we wanted to coincide with the Emmys, so we did like a, a wrap-up of what we've liked and not like calling the bingies and purgies. So it's like, a, <laughs> I know it's silly, but we, the thing is we're also comedians, and we want the show to be fun. It's not, you know, we're not uptight critics, no. you know, we're not, you know, you know, we're, we're just regular guys and, and we hope the show is enjoyable and it's how we, you know, we either like something or we don't and uh, we like to have a good time with it. All right. So binge or purge obviously refers to that since content has become more streaming in nature, people tend to binge on this stuff, right? And watch the whole season in one sitting or in one weekend or whatever, right? And so yeah. you're basically telling people waste your weekend or don't waste your weekend. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> 
Pretty much. Yeah. Pretty much. Because we're, we're wasting our weekend for you, you know? <laughs> both, I know now both you guys are comedians, so you're in the Hollywood scene and whatnot. Are you both actors as well, or are you just doing comedy? We are in SAG. Yeah. <laughs> but and, no, we're not yeah, actors. We're, no, we're not actors. <laughs> However, we do actually have a movie that, uh, that we made. Well, he made, I'm in, and it's called 818. And it's available on Amazon Prime. Yeah, it's on Amazon Prime. Just came out about a week ago. A lot of our friends are in it. Uh, we're both in it. Demo's like the star, one of the stars of it. I'm barely in it, but uh, yeah, you're in it Am too much. I'm in it too much. <laughs> uh, but that's on Amazon Prime. So that's thanks for remi reminding. Yeah, us. what is that? What is that movie about? That is kind of like five separate stories that end up kind of weaving together towards the end. So it's a little bit like Magnolia or um, Crash or something like that. It's set here in the San Fernando Valley and uh, it's an hour and a half long, so it's not that big of a time. Commitment. Yeah, it's not, it's not a big commitment. So, you know. <laughs> All right. For it. Yeah, binge. <laughs> All right. So oh, and also one, one other thing, I think a lot of people when they're looking for us, uh, they go binge and purge. Yeah. And you want to stress the or. It's binge or purge because there, there's other things out there. Binge or purge, and it's like they end up seeing about you know videos about you know people you know bulimic and stuff. Like that. Yeah. So we just want to make sure it's binge or purge streaming reviews, binge or purge podcast, and um, we like we're having fun with it, and we you know we hope people enjoy it yeah. and get something you know get a, get something out of it. It's like oh yeah, that was a good show. What do you think about this switch in the way people consume media from like watching their TV shows once a week on, you know, on regular network television or on a cable station to this thing where like the entire season is put up and you can watch it all in one sitting. And the, there definitely is much more of this sort of effect of being captured by what you're watching, right? Of being ensconced in it, by of being sort of swept away, almost more like a book. Like if you go away for a weekend on the beach and you yes. the whole book in a weekend, you feel yeah. much more a part of it, much more personal connection. The only thing I could think of that ever maybe made people feel that kind of personal connection before is people who get really obsessed with soap operas, right? And they really identify with some of the characters because they're on every day. Right. right? But um, do you think, how has it changed, uh, the way people are consuming this now, how has it changed sort of the business in general and the kinds of stories that are now making it to the screen as opposed to what we used to see like in the 80s and 90s? Well, first off, I hate it. I'm, you know, call me, call me like, you know, you know, get off my lawn. But I do enjoy the, the one a week release of a show. Okay. Because I think it connects people better. You know, it's like, did you see Game of Thrones? And it's like, everybody knows you're talking about that one episode for that week. It's like, did you see House of Cards? And it's like, well, what, what season did you see her? How long are you in this season? It's like, oh, I watched it all in a weekend. Oh, I haven't gotten this far yet. I think it kind of fragments people a little bit. Well, also you're afraid of, of telling people something that they you don't want to You don't want to like, you're like, oh, and it's like, if people like, you know, oh, I haven't watched it, you can't tell me. And it's just like, you know, okay, but it's all available. And that's what we kind of, on our show, we make sure we don't give out any spoilers when we review something because we, we want people to go in fresh, but I do think I, I miss out on that communal experience where everybody has to watch that one episode that week, right. you know, and I, I think the, now there is something cool about, like you said, a great book and it's like, you just get so into it. You're like, oh my God, this is a, I'm obsessed with it. But like an example would be the marvelous Mrs. Maisel on Amazon prime. Like mm -hmm. it comes out once a year and I go through it in, in like two days and then it's gone. Part of me almost wishes like I got a month of it. Like, you know, every, you know, it, it would make it expand it as opposed to like, it's like just an injection of it. It's like, all right, Mrs. Maisel, boom. And then it's like, oh, nothing for a year. So you're saying you want ayahuasca, not DMT. Yeah. <laughs> I got you. Yes, that's you're the, long tri you're the long tripper, right? Yes, yes. And like also, I thought, um, I also watched The Handmaid's Tale. He doesn't. I do. And um, they'll release the first three episodes to get you primed. But then the next 11 episodes are once a week. And I, I do enjoy that. 
And I know that um, Disney Plus is coming out in a month or so, and they're going to release their shows weekly as well. So I that's interesting. There is a backlash to it. Yeah. Well, I think it could maybe will appeal to different kinds of audiences. What is Handmaid's Tale on? Handmaid's Tale is on Hulu. Hulu. Do you know, guys yeah. know that there's a conspiracy about Hulu, too? Have you guys heard about the Hulu conspiracy? No. <laughs> it, it's, actually, it's actually true. So you can go back. Uh, you can look to see it on other people's shows as well. But if you go back in the archives, actually, of Off Planet Radio, Randy interviewed a couple named John and Bonnie Mitchell. And they had done research into Hulu and some of the technology and algorithms that are being used to run that have a different, it's different than Netflix or Amazon. And it is actually, they're actually intentionally putting things in the software to control the minds of the viewer. And they're, it's, uh, they're using like mm, certain kinds of algorithms and frequencies. And then some of the stuff on Hulu involves what's called mnemonic circles, right? Which is a visual effect on the screen that sort of entrances people without them knowing it. And if you actually remember when Hulu first came out, there were those uh, commercials with Alec Baldwin where he had like that slimy alien thing around oh, his yeah, head. Oh yeah, 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 his yeah. Brain. Yeah, I remember right. that. That was melting his brain. That's pretty much what their algorithm is designed to do to you. And so they were telling you <laughs> with their very first announcement, here we are, we're here to absolutely fry your brain. But these John, <laughs> John and Bonnie Mitchell characters, they, they, they've done a lot of research. They're actually right on, and there's been more research that's come out since then to do it. But Hulu is different than, than the others. Like, you know, I'm, there's, I mean, there is conspiracy beh behind all of this kind of stuff, but actually baked into what Hulu was was this idea that that we're just going to absolutely entrance people with the flicker rate, the algorithms, and things like that. So I'm just wondering wow. if you heard that. Yeah. Based on the shows that we reviewed from Hulu, they fried their own brains while they were at it. <laughs> I, don't we've liked, I don't think we've liked anything from Hulu. A couple things, but I think Hulu's the weaker of the streaming services. Mm -hmm. Though, though I guess I do love The Handmaid's Tale, which I highly recommend. He doesn't, he doesn't watch it, but but yeah, I, you know, the, what's the big the big show other than that on Hulu? But now it's owned by Disney, so who knows what's going to happen. And Disney's There's your conspiracy theory. <laughs> <You're right>. Disney. <laughs> well, Disney's been frying mine since about the 1940s or 50s, <laughs> right? So it <laughs> doesn't surprise me that they'd take over there. So, all right. Well, that's cool. So do you guys have, you guys have done 25, well, you guys do one or two series a week? We usually do about two each. So I'll do two and he'll do two. Sometimes we've both watched it. Mm -hmm. We don't tell each other what, what we've reviewed till we're in the podcast. Oh, that's so cool. To surprise each other. So you, guys, the magic. Yeah. <laughs> so you guys have reviewed somewhere between 75 and 100 things at this point then. I, I think Something like that. Sounds about right. that sounds about right, which is We've never watched this much TV. I mean, and I watch a lot of TV, but now it's like, I got to watch work. TV. It's work. My entire life, TV has been nothing but fun. And now yeah. I'm like, oh, I got to watch this show. It's like, yeah. Right. No. <laughs> we're sitting there with a notepad, you know. Yeah. 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 It's like we're like critics or something. Not that we're not claiming to be critics. We're just dudes. But it is, it's a job, you know? Yeah. We have a deadline. We got to, you know, got to watch these shows, you know? So it is interesting you know. how having a deadline and having to put something out on a weekly basis changes your relationship for me to infor the information that I used to really uh, just like consume, like enjoy consuming. And, and it felt just like a, a, something I did because I wanted to, not because I had to do. Yeah. And then it, it, and for you guys, TV, and then it becomes, and even though you love it, it's not that you don't love it, but it changes your relationship to the information yeah. or to the content completely. Absolutely. And I never thought in my in a million years that would happen in my life where I like kind of resented television because <laughs> it's always been my friend. But now I'm like, oh, you know, and let's face it. It's like it's not just my tea. It's coming out of my computer. It's a whole it's a completely different world of how we consume television, even calling it television. Is it really TV anymore? No, I don't know. It's just, it's still programming. But yes, it's, it's still not quite television. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's interesting how they told us what that all was too, right? They call it programming and yeah. television. Like they're telling you what they want you to see, right? Yeah. It's interesting. Have you ever watched like, if you're watching sports or even if you're watching like a television, uh, visual recording of an event, like let's say um, a bad call in the game, right? Or uh, 
what was happening on 9-11. And if you watch it without the person talking, your perception of what is happening is completely different than what it is when you're hearing somebody telling you what's happening. Oh, sure. Right? Yeah, they, did, they did an experiment back in like the 80s where they, I think it was NBC, showed a football game with no commentary. They just mm -hmm. turned the cameras on and left. And uh, I, don't, I don't remember why they did it or what the result was, but they obviously never did it again, so. Yeah, I remember my father saying like, he was gonna, oh, they're gonna do this break, breaking thing where they're not gonna have any, you know, commentary, there's no color guy, there's no analyst. They're just gonna just broadcast the game. And this was like you said, late 70s, early 80s. And it's like, this is gonna be some trend. No, it never, it never went anywhere. People hated it. People did not like it. I think people want that chatter because in a weird way, it satiates them, maybe? It's comforting? Well, I don't know. I think there's a couple of possibilities here. So I do think that with sports or with certain kinds of things, people do want that. Like, I always like to hear what the commentators say on the tennis or the gymnastics or whatever. Even though I don't need to, I know enough about tennis and gymnastics that I know what's going on, whether someone's saying it or not. It's interesting to hear. But the other thing is, is that the thing that, it, they did it with the sports game, right? And sports professional sports i don't know if you guys have uh, listened to any of the stuff about the fact that sports are fixed right a, a, a large sports are largely fixed in fact when you buy your ticket to a pro sporting game like basketball football you know baseball or whatever there is even a disclaimer on the back right uh, yeah really? disclaimer on the, there's a um there's a book by a guy named brian tuey i think it's called the fix is in right and he used to work in 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 professional sports and he talked about he talks about the sports fixing. And so, uh, you know, sometimes we get these really weird um, Super Bowls or NBA finals where there's like one of these plays or calls that just doesn't make any sense, right? And it causes the game to go one way or another. Well, I mean, you can look at the, uh, the playoff game uh, last year Rams, between uh, the Rams and the Saints. Mm -hmm. There's a pass interference call that went completely neglected. And, mm -hmm. you know, it was Change the game. Change the game completely. And the, 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 the theory, theory, I don't know if it's theory or not, but the truth is uh, the Saints could have won that game had that call been played. Right. You know, but, but think mean, about, they've been called. I'm sorry. Yeah. Think about how much attention has been paid to the Rams since they've come back to Los Angeles, right? They're revitalizing the economy in a certain portion of Los Angeles, uh, you know, for all practical purposes, right? So there's more involved in these decisions about – what team is going to win or what team is going to sort of end the season number one than just who played the game the best. One of the things that's interesting, if you look back, it oftentimes happens that when there's been a tragedy in a city, then that team's team wins the, you know, like when there was the Boston bombing, the Boston Red Sox won the World Series. When there was the floods in New Orleans, then the, the Saints Six won the Super Bowl, right? right? And it, it, there's all of this energy, you know, now, sure, could there be, some level of, you know, the people want to do it for their city and whatnot, but it's also just a lot of attention being focused in a certain place for a certain period of time. And sports is part of that. Sports is part of how culture is molded and programmed here in the United States and around the world. But, you know, for sure here in the United States, it's bread and circus, right? Well, so you don't, to, you don't want to try and sell Super Bowl ads if it's uh, Tampa Bay versus uh, Seattle. You'd rather have Rams versus Patriots. You got it. Yeah, yeah. So, so, unfortunately for me, no one wants to see the Buffalo Bills. <laughs> Just me. Just me. And I'm like, yeah. So, no, I mean, is the fix in for the Patriots always winning? Ah, you know, he likes the Patriots, though. Yeah, I despise them. Sorry if you're a Patriot fan. <laughs> you can be his friend, not I like mine. like watching the Patriots. Yeah, I, I – Anyway, but it's like, you know, the, I feel like, you know, conspiracy theories, that team is surrounded with conspiracy theories, you know? Yeah. So the whole deflate gate, that's a conspiracy. Right. Uh, what was the spy gate? Spy gate. You know, they've, they've always got something. So what's spy gate? Like the thing with the baseball signals that do they know? No, well, yeah, well, spy gate was that uh, someone for the Patriots was going to Jets, uh, practices and videotaping their practices mm. which is you can't do that and, and then, you know they get and any anywhere to, to bend the rules the patriots will will do it so <laughs> and, that, and that's why that's why i mean i hate them for numerous reasons but that's one of them you know and they always weasel their way out i'm sorry i just, I just hate the patriots 
But but I mean, but but you would think like conspiracy. But there are conspiracy theories in sports. Tons. Yeah. You know, I mean the yeah. the Chicago Black Sox, right? Mm-hmm. All, it's all in there. You know. Yeah. People still think that Bill Buckner, or right, yeah. in the '86 uh, World Series, like you know, and intentionally missed that ground ball. You know, and you're like, like what? And which changed the entire game, and the Mets ended up winning. And it's like I can't live it down. But he's passed away. Yes. Uh, I don't remember. I think Bill Buckner's passed away. Yeah. But there's, all, you know, you think like there isn't conspiracy in sports, but there absolutely is. Yeah, there is. And it's, you know, like even even though today I just happened to watch on like the tennis channel on YouTube, right? The Tennis Now channel that somebody was suspended. A low ranked player, somewhere like in the 200s, was got a lifetime ban for, ma- for max- match fixing. Right. So if it's happening at that really low level, but people bet on that. And since we have gambling is such a huge industry in the United States and probably around the world that, you know, whether it's for uh, larger narratives, larger political or social narratives, or whether it's just for, you know, pure purely for financial reasons, stuff is going on all the time for sure. But that what my point was, is that that part of the reason they always have people telling you what's happening is because you know there's times they need you to believe something different than what it actually looks like (laughs) and if there's nobody there to tell you what you're seeing you might actually see what's happening (laughs) so all right so back to the 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 shows and 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 the you know your show and and the shows you guys have watched between 75 and 100 shows i mean i assume you've watched a lot more but you decided to start doing this what is your favorite series that you've watched uh, my, f- <laughs> we just did a, we just did a, a whole thing on, it. I love this new show on, uh, Amazon prime mm-hmm. just released its first season. It's called the boys mm-hmm. and it's a, uh, a send up of a uh, superhero culture and how like corrupt it is. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's, it's a, it's a dark satire of, of, uh, the superhero themes and how our obsession with superheroes right now. Mm-hmm. And how it's like permeating everything, and it's it's a complete send up of it, and yeah. uh, I loved it. And it was it was only like was it eight episodes? Yeah. Absolutely. And it was really easy to watch, easy to follow. I thought it was incredibly entertaining, but it definitely dealt with like everybody hero worship in itself, and like mm-hmm. and I you know I thought it was really really said a lot about the world we live in because it's not just that we worship heroes, we worship. The whole concept of of people that we worship, and then you, when you you know pull back the curtain, they're horrible people. Mm-hmm. You know, the, the, it seems like the more we worship someone, the worse they are. Mm-hmm. And that was the the yep. theme of the show. And like, oh my God, these superheroes are here to protect us, and you find out they're really out to get us. Oh, like the politicians. Right. Oh yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, it's yeah. I mean, I thought I thought it was so on the mark politically what yeah. it was getting away with. And it sent, it, it sent up religion, politics, and just up our obsession with celebrity. Yeah. And um, it also, it was, the satire uh, also reminded me of uh, the 1987 movie RoboCop. I don't know if any RoboCop ah. fans out there, but it, it, it's, it's a similar feel. If you yeah. like RoboCop, I definitely recommend The Boys. All right, and Joe, what do you, uh, what, 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 is, what has captured your attention? My favorite show so far is a show called The Last Tycoon. Mm-hmm. It's set in 1936 Hollywood, and it's about kind of the rise of the studio system uh, during mm-hmm. after the Great Depression and, and after World War I. Uh, something kind of interesting about that time period, the studios were not hiring uh, Jewish writers or mm-hmm. anyone because then they wouldn't be able to distribute their films in uh, Europe. So there's kind of some interesting uh, social stuff in there, but mostly I liked it because uh, it's about trying to make a movie. And it's based on the F. Scott Fitzgerald uh, novel, by the way. It has Kelsey Grammer and uh, Matt, Bal- uh, Matt Balmer. Matt Balmer. A couple yep. other recognizable people. Lily like Collins. Lily Collins. Uh, so The Last Tycoon, which was on Amazon Prime, or still is on Amazon Prime, has been my favorite so far. But you should mention... Oh, yeah. There's a new show that just came out last weekend, yeah. early, late September, yeah. and uh, it's on Netflix, and it's called The Politician. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he is, watched it. I haven't seen it yet, but I know that he loved it. I do love it. Um, and Now, this is interesting, too. This is about a, a high school senior who will stop at nothing to become president of the United States. So he's trying to set up his next 
uh, was 17 years of his life so that he can run for president and win. So he has a team around him that strategizes and that kind of manipulates other people in the school. Um, now this is Ryan Murphy's first Netflix thing, which they paid him a ton of money for. Ryan Murphy from Glee and American Horror Story came over to Netflix. Hmm. So th this is really good. I like that a lot. That's probably my second favorite show uh, on any streaming so far. Back to the one about, what was it called? The Last Tycoon? Yeah. So here's my question. You said that they were not hiring Jewish writers because then there wouldn't be able to be distribution in Europe. Weren't many of the first studios here on the West Coast owned by Jewish people though? They were all started by, by Jewish yeah. people. And yeah. a lot of people changed their last names and stuff too. Yeah, because wasn't, didn't basically what happened, the Jews come over from New York who had run the picture, the picture theaters in New York. They and in Europe. It's, they they okay. started in Europe. They went to New York, and then you know, then they moved to the West Coast because because of the weather. So, right. but yeah, I mean, all the all the major studios were started by those men because there's a vast vast Jewish conspiracy in Hollywood. Right, the right? Zionist conspiracy, <laughs> right? Like, yeah, which, right? Which is which is true, but we let you right. know. <laughs> right. So okay, well, I haven't seen either of those. I'll have to check those out. Um, that sounds pretty interesting, Kelsey Grammer. Seems like he'd be the right kind of actor for that kind of film. He has that look that sort of harkens back to that time. Yeah, uh, great. Yeah, right on. All right, what show is the absolute worst show you've reviewed, Dima? <laughs> I hated uh, Catch-22. Okay. It was a, uh, a take on Joseph Heller's book. The book they the made book, a movie yeah. in, the, in, the night, in the early 70s with Alan Arkin, and it wasn't very popular. I guess the material just... It, the book really is hard to translate to a different medium, mm -hmm. but I was excited for it. It was uh, George Clooney's production company was producing it, and there's a lot of money behind it, and uh, it was only six episodes. This was on Amazon Prime. Was it? Or was it Hulu? It was, Hulu. It was on Hulu. <laughs> right. Sorry, thank you. It was on Hulu, and I was excited for it. I was excited for it, and I thought it was incredibly boring. It, yeah. just, it just didn't work. I, I could never get into it. And I thought for all the money they put into it, it was a huge disappointment. Was and there, it could be the source material, you just can't, you can't, can't translate it, you know? Well, so it's not surprising to me that George Clooney stuff would end up on Hulu because George Clooney is, it, it, it works with intelligence agencies and what he does, right? If you look at some of the content, if you look at the arc of his career and some of the content of some of the films and then some of the narratives that were being pushed in the media about things going on, in the, in the world, films like Syriana and whatnot, right? Then it's like, okay, this is kind of interesting. And they you basically, the intelligence agencies want certain situations portrayed in films a particular way. And if Hollywood will do that, they'll give them access to sort of seeing what goes on behind, behind the scenes, right? And George, a lot of George Clooney's films involve that kind of thing. Well, it's but, very political. Very political. I've yeah. never, I don't, never read the book Catch Twenty Two. Although I think it's here in my house somewhere because I feel like <laughs> it's in everybody's house. And people are like, I'm, one of these days, I'm gonna get to it. You know. So if there was a, if there was a, uh, if it was a political, if the story was political in nature, with some kind of narrative that for some reason they might want driven home right now, you know what I mean? Then that would probably be a main reason why George Clooney's company would be would be doing it. Um, but a lot of times that stuff doesn't translate, and and a lot and you know if it's not well done, I think at this point people are tired of 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 trying to be driven into the a certain narrative corner with some of this stuff, right? right? Sometimes it just doesn't work if you're trying too hard to fit a message into entertainment. You know, if you're well, not I mean, the, about the, the book was written, you know, about World War II, but at the same time it was about the Vietnam War. Uh -huh. so I don't know if those themes. I don't honestly. I still don't know what the theme of the show was. <laughs> I mean, it's it's something to do with you know the 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 more sane you are, the crazier you seem. I, I, don't come to me. I, it was lost on me the, the theme. <laughs> so I I don't know. I just know that I found it to be a snooze fest. Snooze and it fest. Just didn't, and I didn't really know what it was trying to say. So that was that's why. Now I've seen stuff that's way worse. Right. I'm like, oh, but that was like in terms of something I thought had such potential. And then, you know, oh, people really pushed a big marketing push behind it that just was a, was dead on arrival. Disappointment. And for Joe, what, what for you what was a complete, uh, what were hours you're never going to get back? Um, well, other than the 10 minute Tom York uh, music video montage uh, <laughs> that came out on Netflix. Anima. 
anima. Yeah. Um, the worst thing I've seen on a streaming platform, I think, is a Netflix original movie, Wine Country. Yeah, Wine Country that Amy Poehler directed. And it had my, her, Maya Rudolph in it. Um, bunch of people. Bunch of people. Uh, bunch of Tina Fey. Super talented people across the board. And I was like, this is going to be great, you know? Uh, but terrible, just a nothing script. Was it, it was like... like was it like they were trying to make like a, another version of what was that one that like Sandra O oh was in about winemaking several years ago? Oh, Sorry. Sideways? Yeah. No, Sideways to me, I love Sideways. Was great. sideways. Right. But was this like but, an attempt to recapture something like that that just didn't work or? or? No, it was, it, was it, was like, like it was more like brides, bridesmaids light. And it's okay. like the women are gonna go away at, for a, on a wine tasting weekend and hilarity will ensue, but ah. no hilarity. Gotcha. Just a yeah. lot of ensue. No, Sideways was great. That was Sandra Oh and Paul G. Uh, Paul Giamatti. Paul Giamatti, right? Yeah, yeah. that was. Paul, really good. It is still one of my all-time favorite performances. Yeah, it was a good yeah, movie. I mean, it, was, it played such a perfect sad sack in that. I really, yeah. sadly related to it very well. <laughs> but but it's. I mean, that was that was uh, twenty years. 20 years ago, 15. It, it was yeah. two thousand and four. Yeah. When, whenever that was, I don't know. I don't. Math is not my thing. Anyway early to mid 2000s and that movie still sticks with me fantastic so if you I, side note sideways check it out if you have yeah, for sure yeah. and what do you yeah. guys what's the, like for you guys can answer one at a time or whoever wants to take the question or whatever what has been the weirdest thing you watch where you're just like where on earth did somebody come up with this idea hmm. oh, which one has made you really scratch your head and go what what the fuck um I am mother. <laughs> it, it was a sci it was a sci-fi movie with Hilary Swank, and um, it was basically about AI, which I find AI to be fascinating. But it, it never it never went anywhere. It, it was about a, 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 a you know it's a dystopian apop apocalyptic movie where uh, this robot is trying to raise a human child, mm -hmm. and it's got some interesting ideas in it, but there's no real payoff. Mm -hmm. It sort of doesn't really go anywhere. Lots of money into it. Looks great. Great production design. Great cinematography. Uh, the lead is, well, co-stars co Hilary Swank. And I went like, oh, yeah, you know, and Netflix put a lot of buzz behind it. But it just didn't. And I was like, well, it didn't, it didn't work. It didn't work. Yeah. And I think, like, it got into, like, AI. But I thought there was, there was more into it. That more could I think AI is a great field for for going in for sci-fi. Mm -hmm. I just feel like we haven't hit it yet because I think for me AI is a huge threat. That's just me though. It's like we had the Terminator movie. I know I'm saying we had the Terminator movies, and it's like you know you're like oh it's science fiction, but I'm like I think James Cameron was on to something, and I think we're openly saying yeah bring it on. Like we don't have to create all these machines, but we are. Right. Like just the other day, was it on Twitter? I, I saw something. There's this new thing that you the this company creates um, AI voice recognition and facial recognition for job interviews. Mm -hmm. So when you go in for a job interview, you're being interviewed by AI, mm -hmm. not so much as a person. Right. And that that's that's crazy you know what if you have resting bitch face you'll never get a job <laughs> you know what i mean it's like i'm just saying like there's there's so many parameters to a person and i, I hate the idea of like well there's all these you know algorithms that can determine i'm like you got to have basic human human contact when you're thinking about hiring and they're like oh but this weeds out the you know who, who won't work at all you know based on a computer program i don't know that freaks me out it's, it sounds like it's facial recognition software so they can really pull up any dirt on you other you know because at this point you know just doing a background check on somebody might not pull up the kind of dirt that they want but if they're using facial recognition software they can tap into you know other kinds of surveillance apparatus Right, right to sort of see the lifestyle of this person so you know they can get the geometry of your face while you're interviewing and meanwhile have somebody who has if they have high-tech surveillance software and ability to tap into databases and things like that they can probably track and trace 
you know, what your movements have been and, and possibly even listen in on some of your phone conversations if they know what voice. Great. So here's my question to you, Demo. Do you think yeah. AI takeover is coming or do you think it's already happened? Oh, I, it's, it's coming. It's, I don't, I, you know, I don't know if it's here, but I mean, it's definitely, we're right on the horizon of it. And it's like, I went to a McDonald's the other day and I went up to the counter and the counter people were like, no, 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 go use the machine. And I'm like, we're, we're just, I don't, why, what is the purpose? Of, what, what is the benefit other than efficiency, right? Oh, it's efficient, but it's going to wipe out so many jobs. And I just, I don't, I feel like we're like, we're doing it because we can. I I don't want to sound like Jeff Goldblum in Jurassic Park. It's like right. you know, where it's like you know you know, you know we, we could, but we know we should, stop to think if we should. You know, right. uh, you know, it's like it's a great Goldblum impression. I, yeah, my Goldblum is terrible. I'm sorry, but I, I I you you these things are happening, and I'm like, do why are we doing this? Have you paid any know. attention to? Do you know who Andrew Yang is? Oh sure, yeah, and I mean, here's the thing: Andrew Yang's not going to be president. He's not going to win. But he is right that at some point we are probably going to have to have a universal income because the, the jobs are just not going to be there. Automation yeah. is going to wipe out so much of of uh, people's employment opportunities. Yeah, it is. I, it is interesting what he talks about with automation, and he's right about automation. Um, this idea of universal basic income, right? Like uh, on one sense, it sounds like it could be a transitional idea, but in another sense, it's actually something that a lot of the elite have wanted for a long time because it makes people yet more reliant on government and more reliant on somebody outside of themselves, uh, which makes them ultimately more controllable. So then you have a situation, see with Andrew Yang, I think he's probably a decent person, but I think that there's high, there's there's higher ups that would like to use his idea. It's not really his own idea, but he's a fresh face pushing it. To right. push other things. Nobody ever asks the really important questions though, which is like, what would you have to do to get this? Would everybody get this? Or is there gonna be rules like you have to vote in order to get it, right? Well, what if you don't, or you have to get vaccinated in order to get it. So then it becomes not, whenever they name it, he calls it the freedom dividend. It sounds like the Patriot Act to me. You know what I mean? Whenever they name it, something like that, I'm highly suspicious. But some of these ideas that he's pushing are ideas that people who like George Soros and others who, who have nefarious dealings with money, because some people think nefarious, others think wonderful, depending on what your political persuasion is. But ultimately, it's, it's, being, it's an idea that's being pushed by someone who's not the person talking about it. You know what I mean? So, but he's right about automation. You know, we do, you know, but I think the better question, rather than saying, well, this is going to happen. And so we have to do this thousand dollar a month thing to bridge people over. I think a better thing is to ask that question of just because we can do this, should we do this? Is this going to remove personal experience from every interaction, right? Like it isn't just a question of economics. It's also a question of community and so social sociability and all this kind of stuff, you know? But I do think he, I, I do think it's a topic that needs to be, to be talked about. Joe? You know, what? On, on the other hand, you know, every time I press this Siri button in my car and say, uh, you know, what's the, what's the weather going to be like later? It'll say, uh, calling demo or something like I think we're a long ways away <laughs> right from being taken over because nothing freaking works yeah yeah it's 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 true there's a lot of glitches so far you know true. yeah but speaking of just bringing it back to our show we did do a review of a, a new documentary on Netflix called American Factory mm -hmm. which oh, deals yeah. deals with the, the the coming of automation it's about a factory in Ohio that was owned by General Motors went out of business. A Chinese company came in that, that makes uh, windshields. Mm -hmm. and they came into the town, they took it over, and it's the conflicts between the people of the town and it, just the, the whole idea of like, you know, Chinese business merging with American business and what a mess it is. And mm -hmm. then, you know, the, the workers want to form a union. And it, but at the end, you know, the, the, uh, the CEO of the Chinese company is getting a tour of the facility and, and one of the, the managers like, over there, we're going to get rid of three people. They're going to be replaced by a robot. Those two people over there are going to get replaced by a robot. And they're like, oh, great. You know, I mean, it's like, it's coming. 
you know, mm-hmm. it's it's whether whether we like it or not, we're, it, it's coming. But like you said, it's going to take a little while because nothing some, works right. Nothing works right. You know, I mean, ask my 85 year old mother. Nothing works right. Everything she has to do is do a computer now, and you know, yeah, it's a bit esoteric for her to say the least. Are you saying she doesn't know how to wave her hands correctly in front of the sink? Like she hasn't figured right. out the proper choreography yeah. to get the water out of the perfect, sink? Yeah. Perfect example. I'm already there, and I'm not even 85. I'm like, come on, you know. So I think it's like it's definitely leaving people behind, right? You know? So. I don't know. I'm just saying, like, yikes, I guess. Yikes. Joe, yeah. what's the weirdest thing you've watched? What makes you, what, what, the, what's the thing that makes you go, hmm? Uh, well, I was going to mention I Am Mother as well, which I think Demo read off of my notes. <laughs> oh, so I, didn't <laughs> <know>. <laughs> I didn't read that. Sorry. Uh, there was a show called Good Omens that it wasn't, we- well, it was weird. It was like, how did anybody get on board with this? insane premise which i'm not even going to get into but uh it's it's interesting to me you know someone who works sometimes in production and stuff how some of these ideas are so set up and just bought into by these by the studios like you know like amazon before anyone really looks at them and goes is this even a good story is this any good at all because it's too late they're already making it you know so i i hated that thing quite a bit yeah all right Uh, yeah. So, does this has doing <laughs> has doing this and watching all these shows has it caused you to start to like? I don't know if the question has it caused you to start to question the reality that we live in, like the nature of what it is, or wonder why we're hearing these kinds of stories now. For a long time, we saw shows like Cosby Show and Family Ties and Who's the Boss and stuff, and now we see these really interesting. Uh, it's not, some of them aren't that interesting, but we see stories that are obviously about dystopian kinds of things or high mm-hmm. levels of control or authoritarianism, or you think one thing is going on and something else is really going on. Like what has it, do you have, is it changed sort of how you feel about the world in general? Do you have a different idea of what you think is going on in the world now than you did before you started watching this immense amount of concentrated, you know, programming? Well, I, I agree with you. You know, you watch enough uh, TV, you can see kind of where the pulse of, of our society is. And, you know, we had a big discussion about Euphoria on HBO, which is about a bunch of uh, messed up teenagers. And, you know, it, it's the question of is art imitating life or life imitating art? Mm-hmm. And uh, it's just a cycle, you know, I think stuff gets uh, further and further out there. And people assume because that's how they're uh, how the characters on TV act, that that's how people act. And when, when really it could be a complete um, fantasy world that they're writing about. Uh, but yeah, I, I agree with you. I've, I've noticed a, a lot of turn in the, um, in the subject matter and the tone of what's popular. I think things are just are much darker. Yeah. You know, I mean, the most popular show in the world was Game of Thrones. And I'm, I want to, my all-time favorite show, except for season eight, but that's a whole other thing. We won't get into that. But, you know, it's it's about incest and murder, rape. I mean, the, just the stuff in society that you, you know, ugh, the real underbelly, and it's the most popular show in the world. And I love it. And I go, cool. Why do I love this? Mm-hmm. You know, what is it, you know, other than it's great storytelling, which I think people love, people love great storytelling, but the subject matter of most of these shows that we love are, you know, dark and they're not particularly uplifting. Do you think it's possible that they're doing this, they're doing shows like Game of Thrones or House of Cards or whatever to normalize what's actually going on with the elite, with, with politics, with society that people couldn't see when there was no internet? And now that there's internet and people can see and are figuring it out, they're, they're, some of them are pissed, right? Like, you know, people get upset, people don't like this, or, you know, every day there's a new corruption exposed. And these right. shows are there to kind of glamorize or normalize or do what we call predictive programming where people, where it gets people ready for this, right? It gets people so that when it actually happens in real life or the story comes out in real life, it isn't so upsetting and shocking as it would have been otherwise if you had never heard of such a thing. But hasn't Hollywood been doing that for decades? 
aren't they, I don't, I don't want to say like on the forefront of being progressive, but I mean, you know, they do, they, they can put forward a narrative and the longer it's out there, the more, um, let's just keep it to America, American culture it becomes more acceptable because the more they see it in their living rooms or on their, on their TV screens or computers, however they ingest it, it becomes a normal. Whether that's good or bad, I think the more you see something, that way, like you said, when something comes around in real life, people are kind of prepared for it. Yeah. I don't know if if it's good or bad. I agree with you. I think it, like where it really started to shift, like where it really went from like, I think it's the first person to really do this in extreme, have that kind of effect was like maybe Stanley Kubrick. Right, okay. like they, like that really started to shift. Like he watched something like uh, what was the movie, the space movie he did, two thousand one. Uh, right, right, okay. So there, like he used all new kinds of um, filming techniques and whatnot. And you know, you've probably heard the conspiracy about that Stanley Kubrick really filmed the moon landings in Lookout Mountain Studio in, in Laurel Canyon, right? Right. So yes. I think it was around that time that there really started to be a shift in trying to distort further than ever before people's perception of the line between fantasy and reality, right, kind of thing. And I think it's increased. And I think now, I mean, you could even say this with the fact that we're now watching television mostly on the internet, right, is that the before you could make a couple of big movies a year to mold public perception of things, right? And now it's like, there's so much information out there on the internet that you need this many shows being streamed in this many ways to sort of get out in front of or try and put a lid on or formulate some of these narratives before people discover what's lying underneath it that may be real. Does that make sense? So these narratives have to proliferate to make up for the other narratives. To sort of like, counterbalance them or to, 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 to okay now the people have figured out because this information is out on the internet people figured out something is going on here so let's make a movie or a fantasy version or a fictionalized version of it to sort of make the idea seem not that weird so people are used to it but also to get out in front before too many people notice what these people are talking about so later when somebody hears this someone's story they say oh you just that's what they talked about on this show even though the person was saying it before there was a show about it right there might be you know some people who are talking about you know some kind of conspiracy involving pedophilia or child trafficking or whatever right and they're talking about it a long time ago but there's a movie that came out that really took pieces from their stories but changed some of the main things i'm not you know i'm just using an example here right it had you know made made it so that you know something in it was dramatically different but was enough similar to what people have been talking about that people are feel like it later when they hear the original person's story, oh, that sounds like what I heard in the movie. You must be just delusional and sort of, you know, thinking that that's reality. It was a movie. That kind of thing? Yeah. Here's an example of that. I watched this show, and we haven't reviewed it yet, but I'll say what it is anyway. Now, it's interestingly enough, it's a Russian show that was overdubbed in English. Mm -hmm. And it's called Better Than Us, and it's about AI robots. It's set... I don't know, 10 years in the future or 15, mm-hmm. uh, not 50. And people are having um, having uh, AI robot, like, you know, human looking robots for various purposes. Some of them good, some of them not so good. Uh, but of course, one of the robots breaks free and becomes conscious and whatever. And uh, it was really interesting. And it, it didn't seem like it was that science fiction-y. I mean, they made it very, like you said, mm-hmm. normalized. Mm-hmm. Right, like it, there's always a character there doing something, or you know that is questionable in nature, but is so likable that you're almost willing to accept it. Right, like you know, and we have these characters in real life too. You have somebody who's as corrupt as the day is long, like a Bill Clinton, right? But he had that quality about him that was so he was so likable. Or even Barack Obama, right? He was a great public speaker, and people really liked him, and they liked him well enough that they weren't really they weren't really you know willing to believe the things that were there if you just peeled back the onion a little bit, right? So like I haven't seen the show you're talking about, but if this robot breaks free and becomes conscious, that that becomes like an amazing story. You're sort of rooting for them, but at the heart of it, they're still AI, right? Yeah, they, they had a really interesting, uh, the, the show had a really interesting story. I'll have to check it out. I'll have to check. What was it called? Better Than Us? 
Better than us, yeah. And you can watch it either uh, with subtitles in Russian or, I mean, with English subtitles, or you can watch it overdubbed. And it turns out the uh, English overdub, someone speaking Russian, it's not really even that noticeable. I guess the languages are similar enough that hmm. it's not like uh, watching Kung Fu or something. Huh. That's interesting. Yeah. <clears throat> Very interesting. So the other thing I kind of wanted to chat with you guys about a little bit in, in the first hour, and we're going to get into some conspiracy talk in the second hour, but um, you guys are both comedians, and we're in a very strange uh, social and political state right now. And how is that affecting what you guys do? Is it? I mean, I hear it talked about a little bit like on the Joe Rogan podcast and you hear like what's going on with this whole thing with Dave Chappelle and what happened with his Netflix special and all that kind of jazz. I mean, is it becoming impossible to make a joke? I, well, for me, I don't really go near any of that stuff. I never really wanted to or never have, but uh, I don't your, have any. What is your comedy based on? I, 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 I'm familiar with Demo because I've known him for years and years, but what is your comedy sort of based around? That's very, it's similar in subject matter, I would say. It's very personal and a lot of self-deprecating type of stuff. And I think my experiences, silly experiences and stuff, I uh, really don't try to um, address stuff outside of my own experiences. So I stay pretty far away from that, all of that stuff. Yeah, I don't get too political in my stuff, but I, I do think that technology is what's dictating this. I, you know, people now can vocalize their outrage to something that they couldn't, you know, years ago, it's like there's, there wasn't that channel. Now, is that good or bad? I don't know. But I think a, a comedian has to, you know, relate to the times that they're in. They have, they have to be a product of, they can't be like, I'm fighting. You know, they can fight against it. And that can be their, like I'm fighting against these changes. Right. But there's, that's still a product of, they're fight, having to fight against what is the change. And then there's some comedians that are like, okay, this is where, this is where the culture is now. I kind of got to go with it, you know? So I don't know. I also do think that when I go out to see stand up, no one cares. Now, great. It's like, uh, oh, you have these specials and like, you know, what Dave Chappelle says and Bill Burr and, you know, oh, this controversy. But when you go out to an, uh, a comedy club, no one cares. Did you make no. me laugh or not? And it's 10 and, times worse and, and, yeah, and than it's, anything in that special. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I, stuff in comedy clubs, a million times worse where you're like, oh. and every people who laugh or they don't, but you don't hear people be, unless they shot it on their phone, like, Ooh, I recorded it. I'm going to like you, it just goes away. It's like that joke worked for me. Or it didn't people laugh or they don't, but I don't think, I think it's sort of blown out of proportion because I think the comedians see that it's like, they're really, you can pretty much say what you want still. But, yeah. it, but, when they, but when they get on Twitter and they're like, I gotta get my joke out, then it's like, oh boy. But in the comedy world, if it's just contained, then no one cares. Who's but once they put it out there in the, you know, the internet, then it's like, uh-oh, the joke, you know. I mean, right now it's like everyone's, you know, going off on, um, Todd Phillips comment about woke woke culture right. and how you know he can't make a comedy anymore. That's why he made the Joker movie. And and then he's getting it from both ends and people tearing him apart and people supporting. And I'm like, he just made one little you know statement. Let's move like it they it's snowball overwhelmed. this stuff. Overwhelmed. Create yeah. they create these like you know this outrage that really isn't there. It's, it's the outrage mobs, yeah. It's yeah. It's one guy with his opinion. Like, are you really, are you really going to get upset? Like, you know, the guy that made the hangover movies and his political statement on comedy. It's like, yeah, hey, you just got to let this stuff go. Be like, oh my, you know, we have to cancel Todd Phillips. Cancel now. culture. Like, right. And I'm like, cancel culture is dumb. You want, the only thing I want in cancel culture, people on their phones in the movies. I want cancel culture <laughs> to hear that. Yeah. That's all. I mean, that's my real outrage. Just the complete lack of civility in a movie theater. Yeah. Everybody's got to, do, 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 you know, it's like, oh, I love this song in the movie. Let me Shazam it. Why my phone lights up the entire, th I mean, there's no <laughs> people, it's so rude. You know, I'm sorry. I know I go off on this a lot, but it's my big pet peeve. And it's like, for, for since movies existed, you went to the movies, excuse me, and for two hours, 
No one could get to you. You were right. fine. You're like, okay, for Charles, I'm just gonna, yeah, there's no phone, There's no, unless you're a doctor and you got a pager. And then right. you go out in the lobby and you use your pay phone, right? right. But for, for decades upon decades, that's how you went to the movies. And now it's like, oh, this part's boring me for 30 seconds. I better jump on my phone. I mean, it's ruining movies. People, oh, look, oh, well, if we give them better sound and better popcorn and better seats, no, you give me better people to watch the movies with. <laughs> All right, I know this is this is my sorry. <laughs> Demo got Demo got a rant in. That's, yeah, sorry. You know, that's, actually, that's very, but that's, but I very think treasured thing in alternative media are rants. So you just got your rant in. So there uh, you go. Thank you. <laughs> that's that's my that's my political stance right there. <laughs> what really fires me that's up. That's the mountain okay? you're gonna die on, right? That's the one. I, you're I will die on that mountain. <laughs> Get off your phones in the movies. Not in, in real life. He doesn't care that nobody's paying attention and people are walking into cars. Yeah. But well, it's, whatever. That's your, yeah, yeah. I don't care. That's not going to affect. I didn't. You know, I didn't pay seventeen fifty for you to walk into a car. Is that how okay. much a movie costs now? I did pay seventeen fifty to watch this movie. Is that how much a movie costs now? I haven't been to the movies in like three years. Like Something that. like it's insane. I mean, like a bargain right now is if I go to a movie for like ten bucks, it's like woo woo woo. It's practically free. So, I mean, if I'm paying $20 to see something at, like, IMAX screen or something, like, I don't want it ruined by, you know, and it's always the very last second. Like, right as the trailers end, then the movie starts, then there's that one guy, I'm going to sit here. Do, 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 do. All right. I, I'm, <laughs> You're done. Sorry. You are canceled, Demo. Yeah, I'm canceled. <laughs> hey, Thank Joe, you. Joe, who's your favorite comedian? Uh, Norm MacDonald. I've never heard of Norm Macdonald. Oh, oh sure. You oh, have. you've seen Norm Macdonald. He used to be on SNL. He did the. He did the. Oh, okay, movie. okay, I, oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, 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 I know you're talking. He got about. he got fired because uh, uh, Olmeyer there yeah. was friends with O.J. Simpson, and Norm wow. Macdonald was doing tons of O.J. jokes. And then he's like, "No, O.J. is my friend." And it's like, "You're firing me over a murderer." But anyway, yeah. that's how he lost his job on Saturday Night Live. But uh, but he knows. He, he also he also went on the View and said that uh, President Clinton. He goes, "Remember that time where President Clinton killed Vince Foster?" Yeah, <laughs> yeah, like, like in real life, like in yeah. real life, <laughs> right? Barbara okay. Walters. Was Barbara Walters. Outraged. Her head exploded like as a head gasket just went off on Barbara Walters. All right, so, I'm gonna yeah. have to find. I'm gonna have to find that clip. That so that sounds like a good one. Demo, who's your favorite comedian? Uh, I love Bill Burr. Mm hmm. I, he's, you know, even though I, I watched his latest special with my 85 year old mother and she was like, uh, uh, cause he swore a lot. And I'm like, I don't even hear the F bombs. Cause I'm like, you know, but I don't know. And then there's also a, a comedian that I love that no one really knows who he is. His name is Dean Del Rey. Mm -hmm. And uh, he used to be a rocker and uh, he's been around for a while in the clubs, but uh, no one really knows who he is. I wish he could get a bigger break. Because uh, I think he's a he's a great comedian. Did he have a Netflix special? Dean Del Rey has not had any had any specials that I know of. If Dean Del Rey is great. Um, Mark Marin is really good. <laughs> Gary Goldman, he has a new special coming out on HBO. He's good. There's you know there's a lot of like under Jessel the Knight. radar. Anthony Jesselnik, a lot of under the radar comedians that you know people don't know about. And that's what it's like we see them because we're in the we're, we're in the clubs and you're just waiting for them to take it to that next level. What do you guys think about the fact that mm, people are now having to turn to comedians and comedians podcasts to get truth about what's going on in the world and in politics? I mean, obviously, Joe Rogan is probably the most influential person in media right now and love him or hate him. I, I both like and watch his podcast and think he's controlled and lies about a lot of stuff. Um, and then there's also someone who's like rising pretty quickly, like Jimmy Dore or Graham right. Elwood or some of these people. And we're hearing more truth from them than we hear from the people who are actually paid to bring us the news. And it makes me uh, sincerely miss the person who's my favorite comedian and, and, and told us a lot of truth was Bill Hicks. Oh right. yeah. Right. Yeah. Bill Hicks. Yeah. Bill yeah. Hicks. Bill Hicks would have invented the podcast had it existed back then. You know what I mean? Like he would have been on the forefront. But yeah, I mean, but I feel like if I'm getting your point, it's like individual voices are telling more truth than an organization is. Or like, you know, the news that has to be all controlled 
when someone's opinion, they can say what they think. Are they, you know, remember, I have to remember it is their opinion, but they're, they're, sometimes there's a lot of more truth behind one opinion than a whole mass of information that's put out by like a corporation or a company. So what's interesting about, let's just focus in on Jimmy Dore for, I'm, I don't know, people who watch this show may or may not, I've spoken about him a couple of times, I think, but he's kind of an interesting guy. He's a comedian who then got involved with the Young Turks and eventually recently left the Young Turks because they were trying, they're even controlled and trying to stifle what he says. Jimmy Dore is a far left progressive. I'd say he borders on socialism, right? Which is completely antithetical to what my persuasions are, which for me, I, like I'm a voluntary or basically an anarchist. Like, I don't want there to be government. And, uh, you know, he's for government having more control of things. But his analysis of what's going on, like when he looks at the events that are happening, he's not giving his opinion about those. He's accurately explaining what is happening. And then he'll say what he thinks should be done, right? Which I disagree with. I think the solution is a different one than him. But why is it that a comedian who has a, only a high school education, right, and isn't, doesn't have all this money to do research behind him, more able to accurate, accurately describe? I mean, I know the answer. It's a rhetorical question. But we're, we're relying on comedians to tell us what's going on, to, to tell more fact, more, give us more facts about what's going on than these news organizations that that's supposed to be what they do. It's a pretty weird state where comedians are now the news delivery right well look at the president of ukraine he's a comedian <laughs> that's you what know? i he was on a tv show i wasn't the tv that, show what about, i tell you right there you wasn't know? the tv show exactly about the kind of corruption that was going on and the, the tv show was about lost like you hold on oh, can you hear me are you there i'm here can us? i can hear you i can hear you can you hear oh, me okay okay we're back okay yeah. I can sorry. Hear you. sorry no worries sorry so it wasn't, isn't the TV show that he was on about cleaning up, about political corruption, the TV? Yeah, I think, I think so. I mean, but it's like, you know, I remember there was that movie with Robin Williams where he plays up, a, I forget the name of it, he plays a stand-up comedian who then runs for president. And it's like, that seems so outlandish. And now you're like, is it? I mean, look, at, in, in Ukraine it happened. In, re, yeah. in real life and now, can it happen here? Who knows? I mean... Let's, I don't want to get into Trump, but I mean, like, you know, I mean, that's a reality show person that right. became president. So right. anything is possible. But I do think that we are looking for truth through humor. Yeah. Because I think, you know, for, for something to be funny, it has to be truthful. Yeah. It, because if, 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 it's, if, it's, if, it's, if it rings false, people aren't going to laugh at it because they call it out. So maybe that could be why... Some people are, are leaning to comedians for, for their news and truth because for something to be funny, it has to be true. I agree. One, yeah. I don't know. One of the people I like listening to the most is also a comedian is uh, Theo Vaughn. I like Theo, yeah. Yeah, because he's, you know, he's a touring comic and he's out, he's out of L.A. almost all the time. So he has a different perspective. I think we forget that we're in Los Angeles and we're in this vacuum of a certain political persuasion mm -hmm. you know, for the most part. And so, and also all the news outlets are either in LA or New York. So we get one perspective, which is this big city liberal, um, that's how America is. And really, you know, you go east of Palm Springs and, and it's a different country. So I kind of like listening to him and his yeah, sort of Midwestern perspective, I guess. It's just yeah. it's a reminder that we don't all live in in Santa Monica or whatever. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I agree. I like you as well. Yeah. No, no. Yeah. <laughs> all right. So we're going to wrap up the first hour, hour here. Let people know once again where they can find your podcast. Oh, <laughs> it's Binge or Purge uh, streaming reviews. You can find us on YouTube at Binge or Purge Podcast. We're on iTunes. Binge or Purge, Spotify, Spotify uh, Listen Note, Listen Note, Google Play. Google Play. Um, so yeah, and like we want, we want to say, it's you know, it's it's and it, it, they're not long. They average around about a half an hour to forty minutes. So it's not like a giant commitment. It's good for your commute. You know, turn it on. Oh, 40 minutes. I got to work. You know, we like to keep it fun. And remember, it's binge. Or purge, not binge and purge. They're not going to get help for bulimia here, guys. Sorry. Nope, no help. We're <laughs> All right. Make it worse. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All 
All right, guys. Uh, so this wraps up the first hour. We're going to move on over to that patrons section. Join us at patreon.com forward slash off planet media to join us for the second hour where we're going to talk about chaos and conspiracy and answer all the big questions people have about how to talk to normal guys or whatever you guys are about conspiracy. <laughs> all right. We'll see That's you next time. Okay. See you then. Thank you.